launching a target vehicle, the Kurgina talk target vehicle. This will test our ability to put Kerbals up for a long period of time. We are going to be performing our first crewed docking, but we still have our contract to push Bob out of a plane. Hello, my name is Mike Aben and welcome to season one of my KSP campaign in which I am attempting to establish a permanent Kerbal presence in space. But right now I am here with my min miss mapper adjusting the thrust to weight ratio. There, now the burn's four seconds long, that'll help. Um, my uh, KOS script for adjusting, or for executing maneuver nodes doesn't handle really short burns very well, so I just wanted to extend the length of the burn by bringing down the thrust to weight ratio. Now, what are we doing with this maneuver? We're about midway. You know what, though? <laughs> if you watched my... Um, if you watched my video on to Oberth or not to Oberth, it is actually better with Min Miss to come in nice and close. I went through the, all the math of all of that. I actually, when I set this up, hadn't done that video yet and realized in my, my brain I had it backwards. That with Min, I thought with Min Miss is better not to Oberth, but it actually is better to Oberth. So to be honest, I'm going to do the exact opposite of, of what this is saying to do. So we're going to adjust this. The goal here is to be in a polar orbit, as this is a mapping satellite, and I'm shooting for an eventual altitude for that orbit of 250 kilometers, but it's going to be a smidge cheaper if I bring my periapsis in as close to Minmus as I dare, and then circularize after I'm there at the 250. It'll come up actually later in this episode. We'll explain it a little bit more clearly. Let's talk about what else is coming up in this episode. Anyway, actually the highlight, and this is a big step towards establishing my permanent Kerbal presence in space, we are going to be performing our first crewed docking. We're going to be launching a target vehicle, the Kurgina talk target vehicle, and then after that we will be launching the Onion 3, um, the third iteration of the Onion capsule, and it is going to attempt to do our first rendezvous and docking. Also coming up this episode, well, we got some seaplane and jet plane missions, but all that's coming up later. Right now, I just want to get this burn over with. I'm not going to use the KOS script that I have. I'm just going to put this on the maneuver node manually. And I'm not even going to wait for the time. We're close enough. The timing of this is not particularly super crucial. And we'll just start burning here there we go here let's just watch our periapsis to be honest inclination is more important than Does that look an inclination of 90 I think it's pretty darn close there we go and we'll do some fine-tuning of this when we get to when we get to Mimis but let's start thinking about this docking mission that I have coming up I wanted to go to the tracking station though right now as mentioned the docking is actually going to be performed by the brand spanking new onion 3 that you'll be seeing later this episode but it needs a target to dock with, and that's where the Kurgina target vehicle comes in. Now, the reason why I am out here is because I have recently updated Kerbalism, and they have played with the radiation belt. So there's my new radiation belt. And I want to... Okay, it's not as low as I was worried it was going to be. What about... Okay, here I have something in a polar orbit. What kind of orbit is that guy in? Because he's... It's 250. Okay, it's not nearly as low as I thought. Some reason I thought there was an inner radiation belt that was actually much, much lower than this. And so I was worried with my Kerbals that I needed to be careful about that. 
I don't want to end up putting my target vehicle right in the radiation belt, so that's what I'm looking at. But that's the inner one. There's the outer one. We should be good. And this is the outer, outer, outer one. Okay, let's just put it in a 100 kilometer orbit. That's what we'll do. And look at that! It is a different launcher! <laughs> no more, no, we don't have the Hammer R2 launcher. Instead, what we have here, what is this? These are the, I haven't used these in so long, or these are the Strikers. So this is the Striker with the Cogswell in there, right? The old Cogswell engine. This is an old booster because this isn't much to really launch. Really, this is just a probe body with a docking port on it. There's not much to it other than that. Still flies all right, you know? Why build something new when something old and cheap will still do? And just a quick reminder that if you are enjoying what you're seeing here, don't hesitate to like and leave a comment. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you're really enjoying what you're seeing here and would like to ensure that they continue for a long, long time, there is a Patreon page in the description that you can link to so that you can support this channel directly. All right, and now we're on the mighty Cogswell. You know, there's extra, extra control things on here that probably aren't necessary anymore. I mean, there's the Cogswell doesn't have any gimbling. I, I honestly should, like, I could easily slap a gimbaled .625 meter engine on here. And then that would get me to be able to remove these little spider engines, which are here for actually attitude control. These fins are here for stability, but likely none of that is necessary because I do have reaction wheels that I've had for a long, long time in the pro core that's up here. And uh, this thing was built back in the days when all I had was the stay put Nick with no reaction wheels. So it's all built now. This thing's over, overdone. Okay, what do we got? Our apoapsis has hit 100 kilometers. Put it in a nice orbit so that we can easily target it is the idea. All right. Darn close to 100 by 100 there. Uh, let's see. Put this onto a normal vector for the solar panels. We'll just talk about it a little bit. Not too much to see. Uh, you can see there's solar panel docking port right there. Docking port, by the way, this is the first time we've seen it. It's just the Clampatron Jr. But it does look a little different thanks to... Let's actually focus our camera here. How do you focus for it? Aim camera, there we go. <laughs> this is the docking, the Docatron Jr. Looking, I like, a lot nicer thanks to the restock mod once again. Let's point this a bit to the sun. So honestly, I want people to get a good look at this. There we go, look at that. I like the, the addition of all of these little clamps in the docking ring. Just looks so much nicer. Okay, let's put it back. And it's just sitting on a truss structure built into the fairing to help it clear clear the uh, when the fairing shells deployed. Not that it worked super great, but I guess it worked good enough. All right, so this is just going to sit here and act as a target for our upcoming Orion launch. Okay, recondition the launch pad. We have heavy rocketry coming up. Oh, that is exciting. Do that. Heavy rocketry is going to give me the Reliant, the Swivel, and the Kodiak engines. Oh, we have time warping happening. What's going on here? Oh, Jeb's ready, which means that uh, everybody else is going to be ready too. And by everybody else, I mean there's two other pilots. One rescue officer and one pilot that was pulled out of the sea a few episodes ago that are now part of our roster. So now I got a lot of pilots and uh, the Weasley. Its upgrades are all done. And you know, I got a really simple mission with the Weasley. And I'll get in a little bit after that uh, what I can build with my new engines thanks to General Rocketry. But you know, I think the 
thing that I should be getting into first to get this Weasley mission out of the way. And as to the modifications, all I've done is added on a materials bay. So the materials bay, in, <laughs> the, in, uh, in case you have forgotten, <laughs> requires quite a lot of electricity. I ran into some issues with this with the seaplane. And it takes an hour for it to perform a materials based sur survey. So you're probably guessing where I'm going with this. We're just going to fly around for an hour and collect that low atmosphere materials based science. And even with time warping, this is obviously going to get very annoying. But, uh, you know, lots of editing. <laughs> we'll get this over with quick in the video. And performing this mission, we have one of our newest Kerbinauts. It's Colonel Valley Kerman. There's Colonel Valley. Oh, Colonel Valley's not so sure. Oh, I just noticed he's got a little bit of stubble. A little bit of stubble on the Colonel there. <laughs> he seems a little bit more confident now. He didn't like that takeoff. Are these like really... I don't know. We'll, we'll leave it the way it is. All right. Okay, we can start doing the materials bay now. There it goes. Opens up. And we are off. Oh, now it's saying 20 minutes. Oh, because we've already done some materials bay, of course, with the seaplane. So it just has to finish off. Okay, that's cool. That's great. All right. I'm just noticing this materials bay is still clicking down in real time even though I'm at three times speed and time is going up much faster so <laughs> I don't think now I know I know it does fine with actual time warp but I don't think herbalism handles physics time warp very well so this has to be 13 minutes of real time well, it still might end up having to take more than 13 minutes of real time to do this anyway. That's That explains why I didn't get the full materials bay back when I was at the seaplane, because the seaplane was definitely more than an hour in game time. I'm noticing now it says two slots. Well, that's interesting. I'm wondering if the slots has to do with sort of a mass. You get over a certain mass and it starts taking up a second slot. I'm pretty sure... Oops, Pretty sure Materials Bay in the VAB says it that it has three slots or four slots. I'm noticing now there's a second slot, two slots. So each slot maybe can only hold so much mass. Okay, four, three, two, one. Materials Bay is done. And looked up, looked used up all four slots. Collected 10.2 science. Almost 32 kilograms of extra mass. Okay, but we can now close that and get ourselves back home. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why is everything so goddamn bouncy? Wow. Okay. I'm blaming that on you, Colonel. <laughs> okay, let's slow down a bit. We'll at least put a finish on the runway. Whoa. Yeah, see, there we go. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Perfect landing. And with that done, why don't we get ourselves into mission control? Because with both heavy rocketry and a two crewed orbital capsule on the horizon soon to be unlocked, there's been a number of contracts that I've been seeing here for a while that I've been avoiding. Like, for instance, there's this whole Tourism Plus area of the uh, of contracts. And the kicking off your tourism program just involves putting somebody, a tourist, into orbit, which seems simple enough. 
but you needed to put a pilot along with them. It wouldn't let you just fire them off by themselves. So I've been avoiding this one until I've got the two crewed capsule. I also have uh, this one. This one's under Kerbal Academy. Uh, this one is to do a mammoth inclination change, a 45 degree or almost 45 degree inclination change uh, about Kerbin. I like that. And you actually gain experience for these, like the Kerbals gain experience for performing these things. You can see with this one I have to use Valentina to get it to work. And I've been avoiding this one because I just didn't feel like I had the ability to build the orbiter that would have the legs to be able to pull off a maneuver like that. But there's another one here I'm more interested in. This is the other one I'm looking at. Putting a Kerbal in space for 30 days. That idea I like too. Yeah, put a Kerbal in space for 30 days. Let's start thinking about building a vessel for doing that. This will test our ability to put Kerbals up for a long period of time. So we're going to start off with the P. So very much like the onion. In fact, they look exactly the same, except the P can have two crew in it and the onion only one. And what I would like to do is put this into a polar orbit so that we can do crew reports over a wide variety of biomes. That's sort of, I think, the idea. And building the vessel that can do the orbital mechanics part of that, I'm not too concerned with, but with Kerbalism, let's see, we need to keep some Kerbals alive. <laughs> it would always be a good idea. So, if we want them to be in orbit for, okay, they need a lot more food, so there is a small here. This is a small supply container. I'm going to stick that there for now. I know that's a really dumb spot. And now I have 70. So this has food and water aboard. They have 78 days of food, 60 days of water, 5 days of oxygen. So I do need an oxygen tank. I believe that will suffice for that. That gives them not nearly enough oxygen. That's 18 days of oxygen. So we double that. This is assuming a crew of two. I have to assume. Okay, let's change that to low orbit. Okay, now they got 32 days of oxygen. Yeah, they must feel... If I go to crew, if I take somebody out, Yes, that does adjust things. Interesting. So now they got a lot more. Right? If I put jet back in, oxygen goes from 65. Yeah. So it's, it's that's how you can control the crew. So this is with a single crew. Living space is still cramped, even with just one person in there. Alright. I can do six EVAs with this habitat. So I don't need to add on an extra nitrogen. There's nitrogen built into this, yes. Oh boy, definitely if I'm gonna put you up for 30 days, we gotta look at you. My question is, do I put up one person or two? So if I stick in a second person. Oh, I just put an engineer in there. <laughs> I just noticed it said that. Redundancy is, oh, look at this. Ah, nice. Nice. That's nice, nice, nice. Okay, I might think about redundancy too. Living space is cramped, whether I put an engineer aboard or not. Okay, it says comfort is none. But if you put in Jeb, they're still cramped, but com more comfortable. So comfort goes from none to poor because he's not alone. So I think I'll put up two people in here. Call home, that means an antenna. That's an easy fix. It's a little tight on the oxygen, so I'd like to give them one more. I can go to three of these oxygen tanks. I think that's better. Okay, let's see if we can work on the redundancy piece of it. Where it was that again? This is under oh, radiation's fine reliability 
Redundancy is poor. We'll keep an engineer aboard. So, life support. That's because I have just a single one of those containers. There is this. An external life support module. It's only 40 kilograms. And with that, you get humidity control, water recycling, oh, whoa, 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 and fuel cell built all into it. Okay, this might be, I might need to stick this on. Oh, it's not even that big. So now redundancy has gone to okay, and that's yes. And I continue to work on the redundancy piece of it by adding on a redundant attitude control as well as redundant propulsion in the form of these separatrons which are also going to double as the launch abort system and I realized that it makes may, way more sense to put these separatrons onto just the capsule so that if you have to abort all you have to do is push the capsule clear not just not the entire service module it was then just a question of balancing resources a bit and putting on electrical generation and storage. And then after that it was really just a function of cleaning this up, making it look a little bit better, tucking things away. I ended up with the vessel here, uh, 457 meters per second of delta V. That'll be great for orbital maneuvering. I'll be able to get it into a high orbit. Uh, and it weighed 3.4 tons. So the question then became, can I build a booster to lift this? Not just into low carbon orbit, but into a polar orbit. Remember, that is what I want. Well, it turned out actually that was pretty easy. In fact, not only was it easy, it turned out to be just a single stage. Uh, it's amazing what the inclusion of a few more powerful engines can do for you. So undoubtedly, I can lift much, much heavier payloads than this. And this thing flew beautifully, as you can see here in simulation mode. I then had to make sure that the abort system worked. Oh, it didn't come out super cleanly, but... Whoa. It worked way better than last time. <laughs> right, 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 yes. I'm going to call that a success. You might recall another pad abort test from a couple of episodes ago that was, well, quite a bit sadder. <laughs> uh, that was be for the Onion 3, which you're going to see in the second half of this episode. So... I went into the VAB, made some edits with the Onion 3, so it has this superior abort system. So now both of my two crewed orbiters have a similar abort system. But let's get into the booster just a little bit. And what I'm interested in here is just how much weight can this thing carry up into just an equatorial low carbon orbit. So I removed the orbiter, just started adding on fuel cans with the fuel turned off so they're just dead weight and just saw how many do I add on until I have a delta V in the booster in around 3600 meters per second which is what I like to budget for my low orbit insertion there we go that should be good so what do we have for payload weight I'm gonna take off this much Payload weight of oh, oh, 5,000, so I'm going to call that 5.1 tons. That is spectacular in my mind. Alright, so what we're going to do is open up sub-assemblies and we'll add this booster to our list. There we go, and ooh, there is a bit of a jump here. <laughs> this guy can lift 3 tons more than my previous record. I'm going to have to be putting probably some lifters in between and to be honest I could build something a lot heavier than this I mean I haven't gotten into this is a single stage for goodness sakes but anyway we shall christen this because it has three Kodiak engines pushing it up this is the Kodiak 3 so we'll save that for prosperity and we'll get to our rendezvous mission very, very shortly, but we're just going to spend a little bit of time with Jeb and Bob in our seaplane.
and Jeb and Bob have two contracts here they're going to try to complete. The first one we're going to do is coming from the field research contract pack and it is to fly to a suggested waypoint at the northern ice shelf, splash down there, do a crew report and an EVA report. Sounds simple enough, but you might recall that the last time the seaplane flew, it actually had a very similar mission, this time at the southern ice shelf, and uh, something went wrong and the mission didn't get fulfilled. Now, I got some ideas of what might, went, might have went wrong, <laughs> and we'll talk about those actually when I get closer to where the waypoint is. Uh, but right now, let's take a look at the other mission. The other mission, well, is to jump out of a plane. We gotta get above 2,500 meters. We gotta exit your jumper from the plane. We gotta land your jumper safely, and then we have to land and stop your plane at one of the following recovery areas. So the plan is gonna be, I'm gonna do this one first, fly to the ice caps, then we're gonna fly back, and then we're going to boot Bob out of the plane. You are going to hopefully get his parachute going, and then I'm going to jump back to the plane and just kind of follow Bob down, and uh, then we'll land and we'll pick him up again. I guess? We'll see how this goes. Yeah. Sweeping low here because I'm pretty sure I see something. Closing in on our waypoint, we're only what, about 114 kilometers away, but there is definitely, look, it's just on this hilltop. Is that one of the uh, tracking antennas, the communication antennas for uh, on Kerbin? I think it is. Just happened to be going right. I guess we can check by going here. There, see, yeah, I got a communication signal with something on that hilltop. I'm just gonna buzz it. on our way there. Let's put this on. <laughs> Don't want to crash into anything. Nice. I love the fact that there actually are physical antennas on the ground for our communication network as opposed to just like random spots for the green lines to go to. Very cool. Now, as we're coming in here, we've gotten these multiple waypoints. There's two of them here, and you can see they're kind of showing up here. Um, they're, a, a viewer pointed out that they are a suggested place to splash down, that you don't have to splash down at them, and that you only have to splash down at one of them. Before I went, there was three of them scattered around the southern ice shelf, and I went for all of them. But he said that was unnecessary, so that apparently might have been one of the things I did wrong last time I did one of these missions, and why, you might recall, it didn't actually fulfill, and then I just Alt-Alt-Alt-F12'd it using the cheat menu. Looks like we might have a little bay back here that we can get in. Okay, crew report, that is done, and if you notice, oh no, it didn't show up, but here's where I did screw up for sure last time, let's open this up, is that I had Val, I think it was, come out to do an EVA report splash down, but she stood on the wing, and if you look at that video carefully, you'll see that it actually says that she was landed, not splashed down, but now the situation is splashed down, last time that wasn't green. But I've now definitely done an EVA report splash down at the ice caps. And that got done. As far as I'm concerned though, I've done it. It might be that Kerbalism and this mod just doesn't get along. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't gonna work. We'll set a waypoint for home, but uh Yeah, I think this is borked. I think this is gonna be the end of this contract. I'll just alt twelve and cheat my way to getting it, and then I'm done with these field research contracts. I really don't think they get along with Kerbalism. But uh, but we still have our contract to push Bob out of a plane though. Alright Bob, I think we are getting to our drop zone here, so let's do her. Okay, so leave seat Bob. 
Ah, bob, bob, bob. Okay, deploy parachute. Where's the parachute? Fully deploy parachute. Semi-deploy parachute. He's unconscious? Why is he unconscious? That's... There he is. Okay, fully deploy parachute. There he goes. Okay, back. Okay, plane. How you doing, plane? <laughs> oh, I see his parachute. So I'm assuming this is all... All good. Whoa, oh, Bob! <laughs> nah, he should just be able to land. I, I don't think I need to have him be my active... Oh, there, I'm keeping a good eye on him now. I should not have to be active on him. Land your jump. Oh, that's already green. Land your jumper safe. Okay, let's just land. Jeb, let's just get her down. Boom. Oh, all green. Where's Bob? Touch slowly. Doop, doop, boop. All right, Bob. Contract complete. Bob's on the ground safely. All right. That was a success. Let's get ourselves to the launch of the Onion 3. We have the Kurgina target vehicle targeted, and you can see it's just moving past from being overhead. That's about right. We'll launch right around now. And our pilot, our pilot is Lieutenant Dan Kerman, one of our newest Kerbals. And while it's going up, we'll talk about the booster. And once we have this in orbit, we'll talk about the actual vehicle itself. And I'm just happy that I'm putting up a vehicle that isn't just about getting into orbit with a Kerbal and getting back down. This is actually going to accomplish something. So right now we got the asparagus staging going. It's running on these outside bigger boosters. Uh, there we go. We're draining that tank. I like to use the fuel flow priority so you drain the tanks from the bottom up. And that forces, keeps the center of mass Forward. In fact, keep steadily moving the center of mass forward, and that helps keep the rocket a lot more stable. But as soon as this top tank is done, it's not even on it yet, but pin it over here so you can watch it, it will lose these boosters, and these tanks are still completely full because I got some fuel lines that are just, where are the, there are the fuel lines that are feeding just this tank. So this tank here is doing all... All these engines are all running, but they're all feeding off of just these tanks. This is going for a long time on the big tanks. It's nice to get the big tanks drained first, because uh, that's a mass saving, right? You want to drop your tanks, biggest tanks first. It's the better plan. So, here we go. The top tank is now draining. Once that's empty, we should be losing them. You can see I have some Separatrons finally attached to my boosters, so they will push it away. Hopefully they will not be crashing into each other or anything else. And there's also parachutes on them, so stage recovery should recover them. Here we go. Nice. Nice clean separation. And we're now down on these boosters. Again, all the engines running. But now we're draining just these tanks. And we're leaving the central core alone. You can see that central core is just 0.625 meter parts. Uh, that ended up working much, much better. These engines aren't the most powerful engines in the world. So that's why the asparagus staging is really helping, really letting me use all these engines all the way through the entire set. No, there's no lazy engine. Well, there are lazy engines in the orbit. About that. There are a few engines in the orbit that are good. See, we're losing now the top tank. Again, we've got Separatrons to push them out of the way. We're staging them any moment. There we go. Awesome. Right. And now we're just on a single Valiant engine, but because this isn't, although this is long, there's not a lot of fuel mass here. Oh, the engine just cut off. We hit our Apple apps, so I'm assuming, yes, we did. So now we're coasting towards Apple apps. I 
And I do like rendezvousing this way, like just going into an orbit, into an orbit that is lower than our target and behind it so that we will catch up to it. Some people I know l really like going straight into the rendezvous on their launch, but it's, it's really less efficient because you end up having to, you're not worried so much about your ascent, you're, you have to pitch up and down to, to keep your encounter, you know, close together. This is the, this is the, I think even the easier way to do it, but I guess it, it, it guess it sacrifices the cool factor from it. Now, we are going to get an auto stage on these fairings. Again, the KOS script should take care of that once we're at 60 kilometers. And boom, nice. Excellent. And we should also be deploying some stuff. There we go. Now, did oh, the antenna did deploy. I was a little worried because I had the antenna underneath the um, this little service bay. And I had them both toggled on at the same time. I was worried the antenna wouldn't go, but it did. So that was all taken care of the script. The script is now done. You can see our, let's put you over here. You can see our craft is looking good, I think. All right, time to start thinking about almost in space. Let's put some lights on. Lights, there we go. There's something I need to put on our I have yet to unlock lights. It is a, a high high tech technology. We can we can put vehicles into space and have them do maneuvering and stuff in space without an issue. But heaven forbid we actually um, put some lights on the thing. That's that's beyond our our technicians. <laughs> This will be nice because this will make Lieutenant Dan level one. And I'll have three level one pilots now after this. And then we should be starting to put Kerbals up in space in earnest. That's what I'm that's the day I'm really looking forward to, I tell ya. Alright, that is 80 by 80 or close enough. So let's stage our orbiter. Alright, and uh I'm going to go back to our booster because there's another trick I put on here is I did hide a probe body and some reaction wheels on here so we can spin this around. I also have some parachutes that have been engaged by that staging. And what I can do now is just do a bit of a burn back. It's not enough fuel to do complete burn back for sure. Uh, that's the end of that, right? Why does it still say there's meters fuel left? Why do I still have meters per seconds? I don't know. Whatever. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I've slowed it down enough for stage recovery. Why? Is there still fuel on this thing? There is not. But for some reason this thinks I still have fuel. Oh, well, whatever. We'll let this descend. Maybe stage recovery will cover it. Maybe not. I might not have slowed it down enough. Let's set up our rendezvous and then we'll talk about this vehicle. I'm just going to expose the solar panels here a little bit. There they are. It's just three of them there. They're only on one side. Actually, there might be four of them all told. There we go. That's good enough. Okay. Let's set up our rendezvous and then, then we'll talk. I want to make sure I don't end up missing my... I think the rendezvous is still a ways away. So, rendezvousing. So, we will extend this forward and we're looking at let's center on here oh I lost my target when I did that set as a target there we go and we're of course looking at those close encounter indicators and you can see once they split that means that you've overcooked it a bit so we're gonna dial this back a little bit and then we're going to turn up the tile. This is going in 10 second jumps, 50, 20 second jumps. And we're going to keep going around here. Yeah, the, the burn's going to be a wise away. I deliberately launched significantly behind on purpose because I didn't want to. I want to talk about the vehicle. Oh, shoot, shoot, shoot. This is all messed up because I hit this grape. This got really big for some reason. 
do watch what happens. I get to here and then I pass the ship and it jumps because it's coming back to just being a few seconds ahead instead of very much ahead. If I hit the go ahead and orbit button, it won't let it jump past the craft. It is deluxely messed up. Oh, might be going for... Okay, this is so messed up right now. I'm going to have to start over again. Oh, that's not frustrating at all. Might have to get in some mods to deal with maneuver nodes if this keeps up. There's a good attempt squad, but clearly something's a little borked here. Oh, we are going to install a mod. This, <laughs> this has just made that decision for me. That's good enough. 0.2 kilometers... That's fine. <laughs> that maneuver is 29 minutes away because we've got to go all the way around. Let's talk about the vehicle. Let's talk about the vehicle here. So the propulsion on this vehicle is all monopropellant. So these are those linear thrust reports. So we're just going to use monopropellant to propel it. And then that way it's the same propellant, of course, for the docking thrusters. We have maneuvering thrusters scattered about. To make sure that it can maneuver. The big thing with these maneuvering thrusters is you want to position them so that they're equally spaced around the center of mass of your vehicle. That'll allow you to maneuver it laterally easier without it starting to induce some sort of torque on there. And because this is um, monopropellant being used as propulsion and these are not regular sort of engines, uh, KSP is confused thinking I have no Delta V left and that's why it's the burn indicator is red, but we will be fine. And then I initially put these guys on as backup thrusters um, in case because Kerbalism does uh, uh, can have things malfunction and I didn't want my engines to malfunction, but I have four independent engines on here. So actually the odds, if one of them malfunctioned, I would still have three other ones. And in fact, all I would have to do is turn off the one that's opposite to it. And my propulsion would still be perfectly balanced. So these aren't needed as backup, but they're nice there for the abort system anyway. Okay, so how are we doing here? Let's time warp to when our burn is. I have no idea how long this burn is going to take. Oh, we can see our target now. Waypoint just popped up. Alright, let's get ourselves ready here. Position ourselves onto the vector. And to engage our engines, we don't stage. Staging would actually be a really bad idea because it would engage this decoupler and then this guy's lost in space. So um, I should probably disable that as a safety feature, but yeah. Okay, so what, what, what we do to engage our engines is simply put on RCS. And I do have, just to show people, if we click on here, I think we should be able to show actuation toggles. Yaw, pitch, and roll, and, and lateral thrusting has all been turned off. Only forward and aft, actually only forward I care about. And the forward thrust has been locked to the throttle. So this these engines are now throttleable. So with the throttle, I should be able to... Yep, that's working. And the burn's going to be very quick. So we just... I have to make sure not to use up so much because if I run out of mono propellant, I can't maneuver. So I do have to be a little careful with that. Get a little closer. We're just going to wait till we're just a few seconds away. Put on RCS. <laughs> So the maneuver node sort of kind of works. You can see this going down, so we just got to get it down to close to zero. There, cut. Turn that off, and then the rest of this I like to just take the maneuver node away and just sort of... Did I overcook that? Oh. Uh, I did there. Okay. 0.4 kilometers, that's good. Okay, we'll back... Oh, oh, oh. Got to make sure to turn off RCS when you maneuver or else... You end up using up monopropellant unnecessarily in all the reaction thrusters. Okay, uh, you know what I could also be showing people, for goodness sakes, is uh, Kerbal Engineer. 
let's get into some rendezvous data. And we're going to tuck it over here. So let's open up the HUD on the left there. We're going to put in another separator. And let's put in some of the rendezvous. So we got some rendezvous data. This is really nice for rendezvousing. The target selector is nice, but it takes up a lot of room. So I'm not going to put that in right now. Um, and phasing angles and stuff is actually great for other things, but I won't get into that. Relative velocity, the nav ball gives me. Uh, what do I want? What do I want? I do want the time to rendezvous. And the distance. Why is that way down? There we go. Not, not the distance to it, but the actual closest approach. Time till approach. I want that. And separation at approach. Relative speed to approach I'm being given on the nav ball. I think that's enough. That's enough. Nice. Okay. So now I don't have to go to map view all the time. Let me put this on free. Looks nicer. Because I can just watch this from here. just passed underneath it but as we are slowing down as we approach our apoapsis it's then going to catch up to us where is he by the way let's turn off time warp find that retrograde target icon there it is tell us. there they are okay we have a few little puffs here Actually, what I can do is actually use the RCS engines like this. Is that decreasing our closest approach? It sure is. Actually, oh, that increased it again. Yeah, of course it did. Got to burn a little bit this way, I think. Nope. Didn't really accomplish too much with all that. <laughs> Still two minutes away, so there's no rush. So all we have to do now is dock to be successful. Still nowhere near to having to go out to the Mimus Mapper. Nope, so we got this good. Okay. big thing with this is just simply not coming in too fast I think everybody's had that experience especially when you're first on doing these kind of rendezvous to come in just blazing hot and blow right by your target it's very frustrating so just take your time if you get bored you can always time warp but I got my separation at approach down to just 53 meters that's certainly good enough and then we'll align our docking ports and bring her on in should still have lots of monopropellant left. Yeah, tons. So one downside is I have no idea really what the delta V is of this, but it does make the design of it more simple. To have only one fuel type aboard. I'm just thinking, let's push this more this way. So let's, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, and we want to go northwards, right? Yes, this way. Let's bring ourselves to a relative stop, pretty much. 
Oh, keep turning RCS off. That's pretty close. Okay. We're going to control from here. There we go. And we got to get over to here, aim the camera. And we have to set a docking port as our target. Set as target. And then we'll reset the camera. Okay. And yes, I do have whoa, 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 RCS off. I do have docking alignment, nav ball docking alignment indicator. That's this little red icon you see here. That is a great little feature. It's very simple, doesn't end up opening up another window. Docking alignment indicator is another great docking mod. Um, where's my ship? There we are. But this is nice. It's nice and simple. Now, just by putting it on here, I now know that the planes of my two docking ports are aligned. And, uh, you know, there are more sophisticated ones, but I like this one because it's simple. Because let's face it, uh, this, this is the docking mode here. This stinks. I, I, I don't, this is not doing anything as far as I can tell. So we don't want it. There we go. So I think I need to back up a bit. Oh, definitely need to back up a bit. Oh, I can start to see my retrograde icon. Nope. This way. Uh oh wow those thrusters are powerful <laughs> I think I need to come up a bit this way oh I'm starting to see now the ship icon the target icon there so I can start to slow it down and start moving towards it There we go. Oh, it's that that's so... Ah. Okay, I gotta change my view here a little bit. <laughs> it's been a little while since I've done any docking and I'm clearly not imp I'm impressing no one. This is the line you want. This target, retrograde vector, and your ship all in a line here like this. That means you're moving in the right direction. A little closer. Okay, yeah, it's just that. I need to turn down the thrust on this. It's the forward backwards that's really crazy powerful. There we go. Come on, get in there. Get in there. There we are, we're docked. And that is that contract complete. We now have our Kajina docking vehicle docked for us. Oh, this thing still has some fuel in it. So why don't we actually use this to do a little bit of deorbiting? I think that's a great idea, don't you? Now, where again is our Minmus mapper? It's 57 away, minutes away from that maneuver. Should I leave Lieutenant Dan? Every time I hear Lieutenant Dan, I think of Forrest Gump. Lieutenant Dang! <laughs> uh, I think I should leave them in orbit for a little bit. I probably can get down and splash down and recover in 57 minutes. I gotta come around the planet. Like, we're doing the better part of an orbit, but our orbital period is... Uh, where is our orbital? I don't have it up here. <laughs> but our orbital period... Actually, I have it over here, don't I? Our orbital period is 32 minutes. Uh, to me, that's just a little bit too tight. So we're going to go out to Minmus. We're going to do that because that won't take too long. And then we'll come back here. But I think that's all going to have to be for next episode. So in the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.